Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this presentation on contact line advection using uh, interface tracking method, particularly intertrack form within the open form framework. Uh, my name is Suraj. Uh, yeah, so I would like to first start off my presentation with thanks to my collaborators. Uh, we have promised our marriage uh, also in our group and Professor Tukovic from University of Zagreb who is involved with the development of this work within the ESI version and Professor Botha, who is the head of our group, and Mathis Frika, who is the PI of the sub-project I'm involved in. Uh, so to provide some context on the kind of uh, work our sub-project is doing within the Collaborative Research Center, uh, we are mainly interested in studying the interaction of wetting hydrodynamics and the in in what influence the transport processes have on these wetting hydrodynamics. And for example, uh, we have surfactant laden droplet flows, like what is the influence on the contact line dynamics with surfactants on the interface, or uh, for example, application of uh, some subgrid models, uh, which capture the microscopic features on a uh, ma macroscopic scale or a movement of a drop on uh, some polymer brushes or other implementation of other mathematical models. And, and all of what all of these have in common is uh, a requirement to solve surface PDEs. And that's why InterTrack Foam uh, uh, is particularly well suited for our applications. Uh, so just uh, just a short remark on the ALE method. It works on it works with a in the continuum hypothesis regime with sharp interface models in particular, and the interface is always explicitly uh, tracked. Uh, we have conformal meshes uh, on the boundary of the bulk, and, and the boundary of the bulk itself is the interface. So to to contrast this method with uh, other methods like WAF or level set, for example, where the interface moves over a background mesh uh, reconstructed somehow. Uh, here, the interface itself is the boundary of the bulk, uh, boundary of the bulk domain, either liquid or the gas, and the interface is discret discretized uh, with uh, further discretized with, um, with yeah with yeah I would stop there. And uh, just to give an introduction to the uh, fundamental governing equations within this framework. Uh, we have the Navier-Stokes equation in uh, in one phase, uh, two-phase Navier-Stokes equation uh, defined in one phase without the interface, and uh, consider and, uh, and 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 on the interface we have uh, a jump in velocity uh, to be equal to zero. That means there is no mass transfer across the interface, and the velocity has to be continuous. And this condition uh, gives a force balance on the interface, uh, which can which is further decomposed into normal and tangential components. And when we are talking about contact lines, we uh, and when there is a solid surface, we need to have a no penetration condition on the solid surface, and the Navier slip uh, boundary condition. And the interface speed uh, here is completely defined by the bulk velocity and the interface normal. This is derived from kinematics. And also similarly for contact lines, we have the bulk velocity and the contact line normal, and it's the interface normal. And, and with, with contact lines, uh, we have a contact angle, and this contact angle has to be modeled somehow, either a constant value or uh, calculated from a, from a given model. So this is the framework uh, from Professor Tukovic and Professor Yasak's work, uh, and they, they're grounding my predecessor uh, in the Collaborative Research Center. And the goal of this work is focusing on these two terms, how to have a contact angle uh, depending on a local force balance at the contact line. Uh, some some examples, uh, before the examples, I just want to say about the mesh uh, mesh motion in the bulk. It's governed by a Laplace equation and uh, it can either be the mesh, it, it can either be based on displacement or velocity. Uh, and yeah, this is sufficiently uh, regular enough to, uh, to keep the quality. Uh, just to give an example of some uh, some simulations with this method. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, uh, here we have the oscillating drop case where we can see the mesh motion in the bulk and the quality is preserved. And uh, here we have an example of a monotonic capillary rise case, which is also of interest to us. Um, and a lot of other work is going on the oscillatory capillary rise case also. Here we have a constant contact angle. Um, yeah, so these are some uh, examples. So um, moving on, um, just short remark on uh, 
why this is so good at surface PD is because of the finite uh, area method, which is uh, is basically finite volumes uh, just in 2D. And this finite area method uh, enables us to have a lot of uh, different models for surface tension. And we are able to solve the surface PDs uh, for concentration transport or any other passive scalar. And we have uh, implementation of jump conditions accurately because of this surface area meshes. Uh, okay, so some short theory on the current work. Uh, so, so the so I want to say the advection problem which we are trying to solve comes from this fact that um, if we have a sufficiently regular velocity field, just a velocity field given to us somehow, and an initial shape of the interface, and a no penetration condition uh, because of the solid wall, then that is all the information we need uh, to transport a set of points here which lie on the interface to its uh, new position uh, given by this uh, ordinary differential equation so the some some point x uh, on this that forms this interface uh, completely depends on the velocity field and its initial position and and it's and when it's transported in time uh, we 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 get a new uh, position of the new, new position for the interface defined by these uh, points now, an important uh, consequence of this is the fact that uh, the velocity field has to be regular. If the velocity field is regular and tangential to the solid boundary, which it, which it has to be, uh, then we uh, can derive an uh, equation for the contact angle, which is completely dependent on the interface normal and the tangential velocity. So the evolution of the contact angle can be completely determined by the velocity of the field on the interface and the interface uh, and the evolution of the interface normals. Um, so the, the fundamental equations I showed before with the Navier step condition is uh, it's a finding actually now that it's actually inconsistent with the contact angle kinematics. It produces only weakly singular solutions. Um, and this, this work, I'm going to show how we can go to possibly a complete uh, regularization of the conditions. Uh, so more details about these derivations and the uh, proof of the kinematics and uh, of the ODEs is available in these works. So uh, so how do we proceed forward from this? So we want to uh, have an advection scheme where we where the, we don't prescribe a contact angle and we just have a velocity field. And here phi can be anything. Uh, in this example, it's uh, uh, these works were done for the level set and the geometric WAF method. Um, here we have a reference solution, uh, the, the solid lines, and with uh, increasing mesh convergence, we see how the uh, measured contact angle from the simulation follows the reference curve. Uh, yeah, so for, I'm not into WAF, but in, with this works, a new reconstruction method was created uh, at the contact lines. Uh, so this is to show an example of uh, what it would look like. Uh, so, so why why know this fact at all? Why is this important to us? Uh, so, I can explain this with an application of a pulling plate experiment, where the the, the plate is slowly uh, gradually pulled, and we have a liquid film forming here with some some contact angle here, and uh, and and uh, and th this uh, kinematics or the advection problem was implemented in other volume of fluid solver. Um, where um, where the measured contact angle was used in an equation called the out of balance Young's force. So we have here the surface tension and the initial uh, initial contact angle, the equilibrium contact angle, and here this theta is comes comes from the evolution of the contact line with, because of the velocity field, and we have the normals. So so this is a modification of the Navier slip boundary condition with an added term on the right hand side. And, and this leads us to something called the generalized Navier boundary condition. The contact angle is not pres prescribed, but an outcome of the balance between these uh, forces here. So what was this? What was the important finding from this work was that uh, with just with Navier slip, uh, with the prescribed contact angle, we saw that the curvature uh, was no, curvature doesn't converge. Converge uh, this uh, it's logarithmically uh, logarithmically diverging. And here, um, in the, with the application of the generalized Navier boundary condition, the measured contact angle included in the Navier slip, we have a convergence in the curvature values. 
so he, now now we could possibly reach a complete regular, regularization of um, of the contact line problem uh, so so this is, so we want to go here and with with intertrack form uh, with intertrack form with all the features it um, gives us so so this work is um, completely dependent on the mesh motion algorithm of intertrack form which is the control point algorithm uh, so just briefly to explain how this algorithm works uh, without uh, contact lines. Uh, so we we have uh, so we have something called control points initialized at the face centers and and uh, the mesh motion here is governed by the fact that uh, go governed by the principle of the space conservation law. The rate of change of volume of this cell containing the interface uh is dependent on the uh, velocity of velocity on the interface so so we at the end so 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 we kind of uh, end up with the volume that has to be uh, swept by these interfaces inter interface faces so that the flux out of uh, the interface is zero uh so we approximate the volume to be swept uh, as a rectangle here are some uh, rectangles here for each faces and we we just compute the distance uh, between this uh, length between the other other side of the rectangle and move the control points there in the direction of their normals or prescribed directions and the least square plane is fit uh, onto these control points uh, then the interface points are actually moved on to these least square points so so in intertract form this is how the mesh motion algorithm works and this point displacement can also be in the point normal directions or prescribed directions uh, with con with contact lines the existing methodology has uh, a ghost control point here uh, with the rest of the interface faces being moved uh, as prescribed before as described before uh, with a prescribed contact angle so so we have a normal projection onto the ghost control point here and the contact line face uh, is moved onto the least square plane uh, defined by this ghost control point and and the contact angle remains prescribed and there is a correction step applied to the uh, point normals at the contact line uh, a whole procedure is involved in that so uh, so we don't want to prescribe the contact angle we just want to measure it from the evolution uh, so we just, uh, as a as a preliminary work, we just did away with the control point, ghost control point. Uh, everything else remains the same. Uh, there's no ghost control point here. Without any ghost control point, the, uh, except the contact line face, rest of the faces are moved, and we have a 90 degree contact angle. So so this face is not right. We we need to still resolve the flux out of this face to zero, uh, and there has to be a volume swept by this face. And so to the next step, we compute what is the remaining volume that needs to be swept by this face. That's the dV here. And uh, from the previous uh, uh, location of the, of the contact line face uh, with unit normals pointing in the displacement directions, we again compute, uh, compute an area uh, which, uh, which divides this volume uh, to, give us a dis to, to give us an effective displacement which needs to be added to the control uh, contact line point to move it to to move to its new position uh, th so this is just a straightforward way we thought of to see what's to see how it goes um, so our 2d verification cases uh, initialized with a radius of 0 0.2 60 degree contact angle and we use the vortex in a box velocity field this is a known velocity field it is known to be divergence free and periodic in nature and I'm I'm measuring the contact angle only in this cell on the left corner here. Uh, so some so some initial results show very good uh, uh, very good uh, behavior with respect to the reference solution. Uh, but we do have a sudden drop in contact angle because we think uh, the least square plane is pulling the contact line point back. Uh, the contact line point the point opposite to the contact line back, and we have first order convergence here. Um, yeah, so just a little more on the out outlook. Uh, this measured contact angle goes into this something called uncompensated Young stress, uh, which which creates which allows us to have a local uh, force equilibrium at the moving contact lines, and uh, this has other applications to capillary rise, which is our other work and extension through extension extension to three D droplets is also uh, going on right now. So yeah, I would like to conclude by thanking the DFG and for funding the CRC and my sub project, which is involved in this. And uh, 
high performance facilities at the uh, TU Darmstadt. Thank you. This is kind of a comparison for us. Like already this this we implemented in a collaboration in Basilisk and okay. sorry, uh Popine and Professor Zaleski's group. And uh, so, so these so because of this uh implementation we could find out that uh, curvature was only logarithmically diverging with just navier slip and gnbc actually produces convergence in the curvature yeah it's also an improvement to the basilisk uh, which we want to bring to open form also uh, for contact line Um, uh, the uh, your method the gray mesh and every Uh, no. So you move the, so you move the interface and the mesh with the interface. Yes. So, so, so this requires some more mesh. Uh, no, we don't do any remeshing. So we calculate what is the amount of displacement the interface has to uh, move to resolve the fluxes on the interface. And then we use uh, uh, this Laplacian equation uh, with, uh, with the velocity at cell centers uh, to move the entire bulk mesh by, this, uh, by that amount of displacement. So... so so the interface gives us a uh, displacement value, which the bulk mesh has to move. Uh, okay, so right. you don't change this part of, uh, anyway, you have... Yeah, the mesh is deforming always. Uh, that's why this method is particularly suited for quasi-steady flows. Um, I can't do jets or, yeah. It's much more mesh. Yeah, <laughs> just follow the mesh deformation. Uh, remeshing would, of course, uh, benefit a lot for other, other drastic uh, changes. Yeah, so the Eulerian happens in the bulk mesh and the Lagrangian part is the movement of the interface. And the... Uh, it depends on the solver, like for example, um, yeah, so in the previous talk you saw in, saw about the inter isoform, uh, uh, where the same uh, measuring the contact angle was tried. Um, so we still have some uh, difficulties to get a full, uh, uh, like a complete follow of the reference solution. Um, as I shown you here, the, I have some. Uh, drop in value of the contact angle here I, I think other method would also encounter some something like this initially we don't know why this is happening yet um, but if you just not prescribe a contact angle just measure it you can have a gnbc condition um, and also another important uh, factor is this f epsilon of x uh, this is actually a distance away from the contact line you have to like define it somehow it's there's no proper uh, value for this yet. So these two challenges are there. Measure the contact angle and define this function f epsilon. I guess the pronunciation is correct. I, I think that if you speak here, they hear better from online, I guess. Yeah, sure. So you have to speak in the Okay. Please just stay in your Okay, thank you. Uh, 
So hello everyone, I will briefly introduce myself. So I'm uh, Mathias Renaud, a PhD student uh, working in Grenoble at the Legi. So it's not actually so far from Italy, it's uh, just in the French Alps near the, the border. So at the Legi, and I am also working with uh, Artelia, which is an engineering company working in different fields. And uh, I'm specifically working with a team which focus on numerical uh, simulation on a flow in rivers and in coastal uh, environments. And so my, the topic of my PhD is a numerical study of score, uh, which, uh, and for that, I'm uh, developing a solver in open form. And so I will just first um, oh, do I do that? Uh, start with a video to show you what score is. So it's a video that we made uh, uh, at the lab. And so you have a cylinder and a flow coming from the left, and you, it will increase uh, in velocity in time. And you can see some particles starting to be put into motion. Uh, some Vortice, vortice is happening behind the cylinder and you have a lot of particles being put into suspension. And as the flow further increase, you have particles starting to move also along the bed by rolling and sliding. And you have like the formation of what we call a score hole uh, just around the obstacle that we can see here. And at the end, we can see that all the, um, all the sediment layer has been eroded. Yeah. And then... You. Okay, perfect. So that's what score is, and it basically happens a lot in the river when we have an obstacle in a flow and over an erodible uh, material. And so you have the flow is disturbed, you have turbulences and flow contraction, and it will increase the shear stress on the bed and lead to the formation of the score hole. And it uh, concerns uh, the bridge, bridges and other, mainly bridge and other. Uh, hydraulic uh, structures such as, for example, uh, wind turbines, offshore wind turbines. And it can weaken the structures and in the most, most uh, extreme cases uh, lead to failure. So I have here uh, some example of uh, score related bridge failure. So here you have, you can see that the pile is not straight anymore and you have another phenomenon which can be important, which is uh, wood jamming. So wood debris uh, being get, getting stuck in front of the pile. Here it's uh, actually the case of a viaduct in Dublin where all the pile uh, has been destroyed and you can see the railway still hanging above the water. And here, uh, the, the worst one where all the bridge has been totally destroyed. So it's an example of a bridge in uh, La Réunion above the Saint-Étienne River. And it's actually a bit specific because here the river is a torrential river. And for those of, those of you who know it, it's uh, the river which comes directly from the Piton des Neiges mountains. Which So yes, and it has been uh, identified identified by um, different studies in the US, conducted in the US, that score is uh, responsible for a lot of bridge failure, actually. So that's um, why, what, why this topic is important for us and for Artelia. And so here you have um, two, it's a representation of the shear stress, excess of shear stress on the bottom. And it's two simulations made with Telemax 3D and open forms with Pimple Foam Solver uh, for, um, uh, the flow around the cylinder with the water the flow coming from the left and you can see that we have really different patterns with open form and telemac and telemac is typically typical typically what um a software used in uh, by engineering uh, companies to study uh free free uh, surface uh, flow and to to make to make then uh, sediment transport and the difference comes because those models used in by engineering companies nowadays they they are typically uh modeled for large scale a study and they rely to to be able to to not to not be too computationally expensive they rely on empirical closure for the boundary conditions so for the velocity on the bottom and for the suspended load and those closure rely on assumption of uniform flow which is not the case at all around an obstacle so that's why we need some other kind of model for this particular case of score which is a really local local uh, phenomenon and on the other hand, we have more physically based model like SetFoam. I'm doing a bit of advertisement for a model which is developed at my lab, but it's, it's uh, quite accurate, but very costly as a scale of an hydraulic work such as a bridge. And so my goal is to develop a model a bit in between those two to be able to cater for engineering needs. So it needs to be accurate enough for to study score, but at the same time to be uh, to have a reasonable computational cost. So here, it's, uh, for the description of my, mo my, my model, uh, here it's all the physical processes which are involved in scores that we need to, to describe. So you, first of all, there is a hydrodynamics and the turbulent features around the obstacle. So for that, I solve the Rance equation or 
it's actually my solver is based on pimple form, so it can be LES as well or anything, but the Navi stocks and some model. Uh, the suspended load, which is actually all the particles being put into suspension in so, into the water column. So for that, I have a suspended um, a transport uh, equation where the concentration of sediment is transported by the flow velocity and has its proper settling velocity, so it can fall with, a bit, with the effect of gravity. And then uh, there is it can be mixed by turbulence. And then for the bed load, so bed load is all the um, sediment transport, uh, the, the sediment which roll and slide along the bed without moving it. Uh, I have the external equation, which gives me the, which gives the evolution of the bed level in time, depending on the, on the bed load. Uh, on the bed load, you, ha you have also sediment avalanche, av avalanches, which can occur when the local slope exceeds the angle of repose, and you all have also exchange between the bed, uh, the bed, and the suspended load with the erosion and deposition term. And for the numerical method, actually, I have uh, I use two of them, so the finite volume method, which you all uh, know about, to solve both the aerodynamics and the suspended load. And on the bottom boundary condition of my domain, which correspond to the bed, I have one finite area mesh so to solve the, on which I solve the bed load external equation with the finite area method. And uh, I, I'm developing the code at the moment. So as I develop it, I've been used coding it in two separate solvers. So I have one solver for the external equation and one solver for mm -hmm. the rest. And today I will talk only about the development of the uh, external solver uh, without the hydrodynamics and without the suspended load. So um, if I'm solving the external equation alone, uh, there's two problems. First, I, I, I have no cou coupling with the suspended load, so I don't have any deposition or, or erosion term. And I have no coupling with aerodynamics, so I don't have access to the shear stress on the bottom. And so if I don't have the shear stress, I don't have the bed load. So I need to, to test the model to have some, uh, to apply some law uh, on the, to, to define the bed load flux. And for that, I just say that the bed load is a, is a law of the bed level. Uh, I won't talk about the finite area method because it was already uh, described in the previous talk. Uh, and at first, I didn't prescribe any mesh motion, so the bed level was just a scalar being transported on a pla plain uh, mesh. And then after uh, after that, I will show you what happened when I uh, make the mesh follow the bed level. So it's uh, I will present you a really idealized case of uh, dune transport, uh, and here it's a scheme to explain how I uh, impose this uh, bed load flux. So I, I say that the water depth is constant and that the discharge is also, also constant and that the velocity, local velocity, is just basically the discharge divided by the local uh, water depth. So basically H uh, minus the bed level. And then I say that the bed load is just a power law of the local velocity. And if I use this really idealized configuration, uh, the external equation has an uh, analytical solution thanks to the characteristics method. So here I represent one Gaussian uh, dune, which is being transported uh, to the right uh, by the external equation. And on the, this graph, you have the characteristic lines. So in green, it corresponds to characteristic line which uh, spreads, and in uh, red, they, they intersect at some point. And when they intersect, we have what uh, a shock at this time, which, which is called the breaking time. It corresponds to when the dune, the slope of the dune gets uh, vertical and it's a shock situation. And after that, we don't have any more an, a solution for the equation. Um, so that's my model to test uh, and see if my model is stable, if everything is working uh, properly before trying to couple it. Um, and I've conducted some uh, sensibility analysis on it. So here I re just represent um, the solution with the really basic uh, advection uh, scheme, divergent scheme. So for the you have the analytical solution in, in black and the, the really basic scheme in uh, upwind linear and linear upwind represented. We can see like really basic results that the upwind scheme is uh, quite diffusive, so you don't have a lot of accuracy, and that the linear scheme leads to some can lead to some oscillation, and the linear upwind is basically a mix between the two. So you have a uh, medium uh, uh, properties. And here it's uh, a plot of the root mean square error for the three scheme and for different uh, mesh, uh, mesh. So here on the right, it's really coarse mesh and we get to fin thinner mesh uh, when, when we got on the left. So we can see that the both the second order scheme are give better results 
less error than the upwind scheme, which is first order. And but at some point when the mesh gets too thin, we have the simulation blows up for the linear scheme. So that's when the oscillation becomes too big and makes the simulation crash. So the error goes, goes up. And it also happened for the linear upwind scheme, but a bit later when it's more stable. And the upwind scheme is even if it's less accurate, it's a, a really stable scheme. Uh, now I will talk rapidly about how we describe the avalanche model. So we to for the avalanche, we just implement, um, we represent the avalanche as a diffusive um, term. And the diffusivity here accounts for the avalanche and it's a uh, low depending on the local slope. So we used a law from uh, Vinon, uh, the work from Vinon, who had implemented that at, as an additional bed load uh, term, but we use it as a diffusive, diffusion term. And here in orange, you can see the diffusivity in function of um, of the um, the angle of the slope, and here in it's uh, uh, the associated uh, flux, so it corresponds to the diffusivity times the gradient of the bed level. Mm -hmm. And just here as an example, you have the collapse of a cone of sediments uh, to illustrate the uh, how that it works. So starting from an initial angle of 55 degree, we reach the cone collapse until we don't have any angle exceeding the angle of repose. So here you have the bed level, and here the angle evolution of the cone. So, and when we, I put the, the avalanche model in my gene, idealized the gene transport uh, uh, configuration, before we couldn't uh, get further, further than the breaking time, because we don't have any more uh, solution anymore after this breaking time. But if we had the avalanche model, we don't have shock anymore because the avalanche model won't allow the, allow, allow the, the, the gene to get too steep. And so the dunes uh, can continue to propagate and we don't have any shock anymore. Uh, and so what happened when I add the mesh motion to that? So the external equation gave, gave me a displacement, a value of displacement of the face. Then open form to prescribe a mesh motion, you need the displacement on the vertices. So I have to rely to some interpolation to get this displacement. And I would like to apply that. So a mesh which has the shape of the dune. But what I actually get is that, so this, this is my mesh. So it's oscillating a lot. And actually uh, I've been looking a bit in the literature and it's normal. So that's uh, this um, equation, the external equation, it generates high wave uh, harmonics. And at some point they make the simulation crash totally. So um, that's inherent uh, to, to the external equation. So at this point, I have two solutions. Either I filter the external equation or I use specific uh, numerical scheme to, to not allow those uh, harmonics to appear and to make my simulation crash. And I say that it crashed, but not always. If I use, uh, for example, an upwind scheme uh, with a sufficiently coarse mesh, it doesn't crash because the numerical diffusivity uh, of the upwind scheme will, won't allow it to crash, but then it's not accurate enough. So uh, that's it. I have been presenting the development of a sediment transport and morphodynamic solver in open form. And my goal right now is to get an operational solver fast. So to uh, so I, I need and for that I need to take care of this instability. So I, I think I will I want to implement um, a filter a filter and then to finish to couple my my two solver. I have only been presenting the XNF form, but the other one is is working and is just waiting for the XNF form to to be totally stable before coupling everything. Uh, and then I, once I got my operational solver, I will maybe come back to this external equation issue and look a bit uh, deeper into it. I also want to add the free surface implementation later on uh, in my solver. And one project that we have is that I, another PhD student at my lab is working with uh, SetFoam, which is basically a solver for sediment transport, but with, which solves two uh, momentum equations, one for the sediment and one for uh, the, the fluid. And then you have a lot of coupling there. It's more physically based. We don't have that many uh, empir um, clo empirical closures. And so we want to, to derive new closure from SetFoam to, to do some kind of upscaling to to feed uh, my model and or other models and to improve the imp improve the actual closure, which were developed for uniform flows uh, most of the time and are not working in, in our case or not that, that good. And uh, we also want later on to um, compare um, the model with physical modeling, which is done by Artelia. So Artelia has a lab uh, in Grenoble where they do a lot of physical modeling. So here is an example of a uh, 
physical model of a bridge in, in Bordeaux. And one of the, we would like to, later when the model is working to, to compare it with uh, complex and uh, actual geometry. So yeah, that's it for, for me. And one information, uh, it's in my contract that the model will be rendered open source uh, at the, when it's working. So yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, what is this tool? How do you or whether do you have to tune the needs or the diffusivity in your glass models? Yeah, instead of your diffusivity constant or coefficient, yeah, to so, avoid to reach the vertical tangent. So basically, uh, you can tune it to if if you change this coefficient, you will uh, allow a higher higher flux of sediment because it reached here, we can see the flux of sediment, it's reached a maximum. And so you tuning this coefficient will tell you uh, how strong can, can, uh, can an avalanche be or how fast, for right. example. But at the moment, we did not tune it uh, and compare it with experiment to tune it. But it could be something that we... To avoid to reach the... Yeah, so that's the main objective. So I think the, the avalanche is not, will, is not physically based in, uh, in our model in any case. So, so the objective is not to reproduce actually how the avalanche, the, the dynamic of the avalanche, but to, to not allow the, the model to, to crash because of shock. Yeah, you did I what? You succeed in the situation of the SCAVA? Uh, actually not yet because everything I need, I still need to couple it. And uh, I still have this uh, issue because I don't want to couple it uh, if I have, if this can happen. So when once I implement my filter, I will be able to finish the coupling. But right now I have to do it before. Then. Yeah. Is what? Uh, I I don't uh, understand you well. Yeah. So here I refine. Uh, also, so you you mean about the the slope uh, value? So this I think. Um, so first the equation is not uh, linear. So I think the the coefficient you you get the right one. You get the order for really not in every case. If if you have a really um, linear uh, advection equation, maybe you should get it. But here we can see that we have more or less, uh, here it's a first order uh, scheme. We, here it's uh, the second, we have basically uh, uh, two, uh, two uh, the factor is two between the two, more or less. The, the... Yeah, I've tried with different uh, delta t, but. Okay, maybe I don't know. Yeah, they are second order, but I it's um, in in the case of a really non nonlinear advection equation, you you may not get uh, exactly the the coefficients, but we can see that the slope it's basically. Uh, between the first, first order and second order, we have a factor of two, more or less. So we receive this behavior. Okay, good presentation. But bad load transport in the turbulent flow through an array of expert loans ordered <laughs> using discrete and method and large estimation. Okay, clear. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, I am a PhD student in the Catholic University in Chile. I am working with Professor Christian Escabriazader, and we are also collaborating with Professor Ivana Vinkovic of Leon 1. So the work that I will be presenting today is related to my thesis. Um, I want to start defining what load transfer is for the ones that don't know. 
And it is the collective motion of sediments that move in contact with the bed by three different mechanisms, as you can see on the figure below, which are rolling, sliding, and saltating. So in nature, we have two types of streams, low grain streams and high grain streams. They are quite different, as you can see on the figure. Uh, basically, low grain streams possess low slopes, but composed mostly by sand, seal, and clay. High relative submergence, which means that the water depth is much larger than the characteristic diameter of the sediments. And also the bed forms are more easily to characterize, which are usually dunes, antidunes, and ripples. But if you see high grain streams, they possess steep slopes. We have from sand to large boulders that you can see on the figure. A low relative submergence, which means that the, usually the water depth is similar in magnitude to the characteristic diameter of these boulders. And also the bed forms are usually caster steps and patches. So I will be focusing on high grain streams. So velo transport, which is my subject, is much more easy, much more difficult, sorry, to estimate in these high grain streams or mountain streams compared to low grain streams. And this is because of these sources of uncertainties that I put here. I want to briefly describe just four of them. So the first one is the complex bed morphology of this type of streams that change significantly along the different segment of the river. If you see at the right, uh, this is a classification of Montgomery and Buffington. We have cascades in the upper segments characterized by this periodic array of boulders. And then we have step pools, plain bed, and poor pools. They are very different between each other and they are in constant feedback with the flow. So the next uh, source of uncertainty is the sediment supply, which is an important factor to consider when it is less than the transport capacity of the stream for bello transport estimation. And then the poorly sorted transport distribution that includes from sand to the large boulders, as I was mentioning. And finally, the strong flow spatial variability that produces this macro roughness. And with macro roughness, I mean the boulders that you can see, but also the woody debris. And I will be focusing on this last step. So the first idea that I want to highlight is that this macro roughness produce a flow variability and this flow variability produce velo transport variability. And we can see the problem at two different scales, at a red scale, which means at a scale of the segment of the river, the effect that this macro roughness has is an increase in flow resistance. And so a decrease in the better stress, which is available for moving the sediments. But if we see the problem at a local scales, this macro roughness produce variability of mean velocity and rain of stresses, separation and a zone of recirculation downstream in the wake sand, and also coherent structures in the vicinity of these boulders. So, and how is velo transport usually estimated? It's estimated at a grid scale, which means at a scale of the segment of the river. The main assumption of doing that is that the flow is uniform, so we can use our average quantity, usually the better stress, then depend on the water depth and the slope. But we can also use the discharge or the for the uh, bulk velocity, and we just evaluate some of these semi empirical formulas. Here I put just two examples, but I want to highlight that the exponent is usually 1.5, which means that velo transport is a nonlinear phenomenon. So, but even though velo transport is usually estimated at a local scale, what is actually a uh, occurring is at a, at a local scales, which means at a scale of the particles. So basically what moves the particles are the instantaneous forces acting on each of them. We can consider gravity, uh, buoyancy, lift, contacts and collisions and so on. But as you can imagine, it's impractical to know the instantaneous velocities over each particle. So another useful approach can be used a local better stress to account for this non-uniformity that I was mentioned. So, and how is velocity transfer in mountain streams? Most of the formulas were performed for low grain streams, as the one that I showed you, uh, but uh, um, they poorly perform in mountain streams. So some people have uh, derived some empirical formulas for mountain streams, but they still over predict the load transport for order of magnitudes in mountain streams. And this is because of the different characteristics that I mentioned, but also because, as I mentioned, they are semi-empirical and they do not, they are not physically based. So the last part of the introduction, some people have proposed a stress partition approach, which basically means dividing the total vector stress in one component, which is borne by the immobile boulders, the immobile macro roughness, and one component which is effectively available for the sediments. So we have two ways of estimating, a theoretical and empirical, both have their own assumptions and limitations. But even though with this approach, it has been proved a significant improvement in velo transport estimations, because these formulas are empirical, just work for some uh, a range of the morphology and flow conditions. 
So my general objective of my investigation is evaluate how the spatial variability induced by this array of boulders influence battle transport, and also, uh, and specifically, uh, elucidating the physical mechanism of battle transport relating battle access to the turbulent flow, and also characterizing the, the spatial and temporal variability of battle transport, and also uh, try to evaluate if a stress partitioning approach, considering the exact stress without any assumptions, improve or not battle transport estimations. So my domain, uh, obviously my approach are numerical simulations. I will be replicating the experiments of Pablo Nicolau 2012 that you can see at the right. Uh, I will be just considering the right rectangle. So it's applying periodic boundary conditions in the streamwise and spanwise direction. We can replicate the array of boulders of the experiments. So the domain is the one that you can see at the left, is one boulder at the center, a quarter of boulders in the domain, and all these boulders are placed in a rough bed. And also I want to highlight that the Reynolds number is really high, it's 150,000, so that's obviously makes the flow more complex to resolve. So I, uh, we are basically resolving the Neverstock equations by means of large city simulations. So basically resolving directly the large scales uh, larger than the grid, and including the effect of the non-resolved scales through a subgrid scale turbulent model. So most of the work on my thesis, actually I did it in an in-house code, but I implemented a lot of tools that I needed to fulfill my objectives. So I received a lot of feedback in my, in my committee that why I spent so many time implementing all, this, all these tools. If there are softwares, uh, open source like OpenFOAM that have some methods already implemented. So since nine months ago, I started working with Ivana uh, with OpenFOAM, replicating all the steps of my methodology uh, in order to extend the results and the validations. So basically both codes do the same. I just want to highlight one idea. OpenFOAM solves a Poisson equation, as you know. My in-house code actually has the artificial compressibility method implemented. You can ask me if you know, but it's not, it's just a detail. But also the, the equation for the pressure is different. So uh, for particles, not the rough bed, but I will I will be including sediment transfer, as you know, also as particles with the discrete element method, which basically means calculating the forces acting on over each particle. Uh, and here is a simulation that we perform with open form. And basically two parameters are important, the chills number that accounts for the mobility conditions, and also the Stokes number that relate the time scale of particles and the flow. So basically I will be considering gravity and buoyancy, drag, fluid stresses and added mass, and also contacts and collisions. Usually when you have ballot transport uh, simulations, the bed layer has a high concentration of particles, you need to include that, and also this extra force in the navier stokes equation. So I just couple in momentum, not in mass, because in ballot transfer simulation, it's highly unstable to couple also in mass. So, and for the particles, for the mobile particles, I will be using the in-house code. I couple the in-house code to lights. I mind you that you're familiar with lights. And also I am using open foam, basically the pimple solver that I include all the Lagrangian library and the uh, code of DPM. Most codes do the same. The only difference is that in lights, you can choose different time steps for the particles and the flow, which is actually very useful because you need a very small time step for the particles to resolve the collisions. I imagine that you can do it in open form, but you have to do it by yourself. And finally, the last step of my methodology is that, as you know, I need to resolve the turbulent flow through an array of boulders placed in a rough bed uh, before including the particles. And usually we have two different ways of doing that. A more natural way maybe is performing a grid over the object. Uh, in this case, because it's a really complex geometry and a structure grid, but we also have another way, which is implementing an immersed boundary method. And quickly, for the ones that don't know what, in, what an immersed boundary method is, is you see that if you see the sketch at the left, this is a two-dimensional sketch, a uniform and Cartesian grid. We do not include the, the object, which is a circle in this case, in the mesh, but we can classify all the points in three categories. Points in red are inside the object, so the velocity and pressure will be zero. Points in green are far away from the object, so we basically resolve the stock equations there. And points in blue are the immersed boundary nodes that we need to find a condition for the pressure and velocity. So both have their own advantage and limitations. So basically, uh, I am using very different methods for both, both codes. In the in-house code, uh, I uh, include, I implemented an immersed boundary method, which is based in a discrete forcing approach, so imposing the boundary condition directly on those nodes. And I am also non-resolving the boundary layer because due to the high Reynolds number, it was not affordable in terms of the computational time. 
So I am solving a boundary layer equation that do not assume any profile of the velocity because as you know, this uh, flow has a high pressure gradient. And then in open form, uh, I perform, I construct an structure grid with a snappy X mesh. Uh, and I am resolving the boundary layer, but the only reason to resolve the boundary layer is because as far as I know, uh, the wall functions uh, are for channel flow turbulence, maybe I am wrong, and they, they are not applicable for high pressure gradient flows. So you can see the grid there. We are still dealing to improve the, the mesh with open form because we have just some layers. We could not uh, be able to construct a, a mesh with more layer within Snappy X mesh. Uh, and you can see at the bottom, a comparison of the immersed boundary method grid on the Snappy X mesh. So this is just uh, uh, the instantaneous flow comparison with the in-house code at the left and open form at the right. It's a vertical plane at the top and an horizontal plane at the bottom. Um, and this is the vorticity magnitude. Mm, one second. Because yeah, was, this is the vorticity magnitude. The results with the, with the open form, as I was mentioning, are still not the best. And it's just because of the grid. So we are still working on improving uh, the, the grid. So this is the comparisons. I don't want to stop on this, but yeah, the profiles with the snap mesh are a little noisy yet. And if we see the contours, there are some noise in the statistics and they are not the best yet. Mm -hmm. And so the results that I, will, that I am showing you now, it's a, all with the in-house code and we expect to obtain the sign with open form. So here you can see the mean flow is this, the stream waste velocity at the left and the a vertical and, a, and a span waste velocity at the right, just for you to see the flow patterns and the interaction with the rough bed. But actually what is important for velo transport at the near bed turbulence stresses. So here I am showing you at the left, um, the spatial distribution of these stresses is highly non-uniform. Uh, and if we average and calculate the standard deviation in, a, in the transport direction, we obtain the profile at the right. But you can see two periodicities, one because of the area of boulders, which is the larger one, and the small fluctuations are because of the rough bed. So the dashed lines are the crest of the rough bed. And finally, we include particles in the in-house code. This is the last part. Uh, there are 3.3 millimeters. We adjust the density in order to achieve certain mobility conditions. So if you see the chills diagram at the right, the red point is the mobility conditions, but you have to remember that this is just with the friction velocity that we obtain in the simulations, but the actual shear stress is much more smaller because some energy is dissipated due to the, the boulders and the rough bed. So basically, if we calculate the global value transport, we obtain the value at the left with the friction velocity obtained by the simulations. But if we calculate a local value transport, you can see the values in the figure. And if we spatially average, we obtain the value at the right, which is much smaller than the predicted with the global uh, shear stress. So just to end, there are some videos of the particles. I hear I just want to highlight that particles are moving always in the in the, in the sides of the boulder, because in the wake, due to the low velocities, uh, particles are not moving. And also particles collide a lot with the rough bed and with the boulder, and that change the direction of the particles, which obviously will uh, add another variability in a space and time. So I will let the video finish because it's not too long. And yeah, and this, it, this is a lateral view, just for you to see that most of the main mechanism of particle in this case is just saltation. And this is because particles are colliding with the rough bed. And it's quite interesting because when I run a lot of simulations of velocity transport in tunnel flows in a smooth bed, the main mechanism was always rolling and sliding. Uh, saltations occur, but less. So it's quite uh, interesting that the rough bed all also change uh, the flow, but also the, the mechanism of particle. So basically the main conclusion with, uh, with OpenFOAM is that we are still working with the mesh. The theory that we have is that we need more inflation layers that cover all the boundary layer thickness due to the high Reynolds number and a smoother transition uh, with, the, with the unstructured grid. And I just left uh, the physical conclusions, but basically is that this array of boulders and the rough bed induce a spatial and temporal variability in boulder transport and that the rough bed changes also the main mechanism of the transport to saltations. Yeah, and there, there is some, some energy which is dissipated and is not effective for moving the particles. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, and it's not the first time that someone asked me that. Based on my perspective, I think that when you do an inverse manual method, all the responsibility is in the method. So for example, in my method, I calculate the normal direction over the object in all the points. And I do not interpolate, I, I calculate a boundary equation, which is not very bad. Uh, in this case, so if I am completely honest, I am not sure if uh, the results will open from yet is because of my uh, few experience with unstructured grid. But in an inverse boundary method, you can have more control of good, what you are doing if you do implement a good method. And my resolution is not very coarse if you compare to the object. But yeah, it's quite impressive that the results are uh, good. Yeah, and also I am not the, the first person that uh, replicated these experiments uh, with an inverse boundary method. So I was completely sure at the beginning that it was possible. He did not use the same methods than me, but uh, like the the innovation in my thesis is adding the particles and starting, sorry, the coupling with the particles. But if I am completely honest, I am not, I think I am more than of an inverse boundary method for this complex geometry than an unstructured grid, because the geometry, even though it's complex for a mesh, is not complex for an inverse boundary method because they are, they are just spheres. So it, you have the analytical solution uh, of those equations, of those geometries, sorry, and you just uh, uh, can do like a method. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, I have not used an immersion boundary method because I think that in the version that I have, I don't have one. And also usually the immersion boundary method are a little case dependent, at least as I think. I'm not sure, I have not tried it. I think that I will obtain better results. But yeah, for example, in my code, I couldn't do a mesh because my the EHOS code, it's only only works with a structure mesh. And for the array of boulders, maybe it's possible, but not for the rough bed. The array, I think the rough bed with the uh, with the array of boulders in an structure mesh, maybe it's not possible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this. So, about the data and the data? Data and the I assume it is a lot of data, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Statistical relevant data, 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 data. So, is it available? Or did mm. you take care of the statistical versions and then also get all the data? That's a good question, yeah. The fly and then yeah, the, dealing, the problem that I, I'm dealing with open home, it's because of the data, because in, in an abstractor grid, all my solutions, each solution is 10 gigas. If I save the statistics, 10 gigabytes of memory. Gigabyte. Yeah, each solution, it's a lot. But in the in-house code, it's just one, one giga. Huh? Gigabyte. Gigabytes. So I am dealing with that problem of the storage, but just in open form so far. And I think that is because of the unstructured grid that need to save all the metrics of the of the grid. Yeah. Ex grid point all, five. Uh, all the, like, yeah. For, That's a good question. But, uh, I take the good things of open form and I replicate it in in-house code. So basically now I am calculating the statistics uh, while the code runs in the in-house code. Yeah, because I learned that with open form that you can do in open form. So basically I am saving, for example, it's 10 iterations just to, because these are highly uh, expensive uh, simulations. In, so just to be sure, I save like uh, each 10 iterations, 
but I am calculating using all the time step uh, while the simulation is running. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of a uh, computational time, or that, that's a good way. I I just want to highlight that I have much more experience with the info school that I'm coming from. So basically. Uh, I have been like two years working with the info form, with the info school, sorry, and just nine months with open form. So that's maybe why I am, I'm not very efficient with open form yet. But in terms of computational time, now it's quicker than info school. I'm not sure why. I think that is because, again, of the grid. Because if you do an immersion learning method, in my case, I have a uniform grid. So all the cells are not exactly, I don't have these tiny cells that increase the CFL. The CFL and uh, you need to keep a really uh, small time step. And this is just a theory of mine. I am not sure. But I think that uh, when you solve a Poisson equation, because I think that the artificial compressibility method change the, the, the type of equations that you are solving, which are more stable. So you can keep a high uh, uh, time step. So yeah, it's, uh, until so far, it's much quicker the the in-house code. But I think that is because of that. And I I, I am trying to move to, so I would like to move to an immersion learning method in open form. It's just because I thought that in the version that I'm using, it has not implemented. Uh, and also because there are usually time that was a case dependent, as I mentioned, a little bit at least. Yeah. Okay, so part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Let's close here. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>